a continuous glucose monitor is a device. There are really two big ones on the market right now. One is made by a company called Dexcom, and one is made by a company called Abbott, and the latter is called the Freestyle Libre, so I think it's a company that Abbott acquired many years ago. These are devices that are worn usually on the tricep. They can also be on the abdomen, and they have a little tiny filament that is quickly shot in with a needle into the subcutaneous space. So the filament remains after the needle comes out, and the filament sits in a part of the body where it can sample something called interstitial fluid. This is basically the fluid between cells. To be clear, it's not sampling the blood. So it samples the interstitial fluid and it measures glucose level there. And it's basically calibrated to know based on what the reading is there, what the glucose level is in the blood. So a continuous glucose monitor, as its name suggests, is a way to give you real-time information about what your blood glucose is. As you said, for people with type 1 diabetes, which was the first use case, this is a very important innovation. Because people with type 1 diabetes are, by definition, dependent on insulin. So they are using insulin exogenously to do the job of their pancreas, which is no longer working. And the pancreas, of course, is like this brilliant organ where it's the one that's auto-regulating glucose via insulin. And when that goes away, they have to be the one to do it. So now they have this device that is at least giving them real-time glucose information and they can adjust insulin injections as needed. It obviously didn't take long for that to expand into a much, much larger market, i.e. 10 times the size, which is people with type 2 diabetes, some of whom do require exogenous insulin, some of whom do not but all of whom by definition have a carbohydrate and glucose tolerance disorder, right? The very definition of type two diabetes is based around unregulated peripheral glucose. And this tool is therefore helpful, right? It's helpful in first and foremost, I think, knowing what to eat. You know, I think historically we have given people with type two diabetes abjectly horrible news and insight with regard to what to eat. You know, I mean, we just haven't really helped them think through this problem. So the CGM makes it pretty clear that not all foods are created equal when it comes to managing glucose homeostasis. So everything I've said so far is relatively straightforward. I think where we now, and this is a great example, by the way, of medicine 3.0 versus medicine 2.0. So everything I've said so far more or less makes sense if you're in medicine 2.0. In fact, I think we're finally at the point where even medicine 2.0 is starting to accept the fact that carbohydrate restriction is a really good idea for people with type 2 diabetes. It's not the only way, by the way. So caloric restriction in general will work to improve insulin sensitivity, which therefore improves glucose regulation. But it does seem that carbohydrate restriction as a form or a gateway to caloric restriction has greater efficacy than other methods. Once we now talk about people without diabetes, Medicine 2.0 would argue a CGM plays no role. Okay, is there a randomized control trial demonstrating the efficacy of CGM in anything outside of patients with diabetes? There is not. But now we have to get into the leap of faith that one takes when you start triangulating between other pieces of data. So we want to start with one, which is in a population of non-diabetics, is there any evidence that glucose levels matter? So type 2 diabetes is defined as having a hemoglobin A1c above 6.5%. Hemoglobin A1c is just a way to measure how much glucose is stuck to hemoglobin. And by knowing what that number is, you can impute what the average blood glucose is in that individual over the preceding three months. So 6.5, which is the cutoff, translates to an average blood glucose of 140 milligrams per deciliter. So the question then would be, if you take two people who don't have diabetes, one of whom has a hemoglobin A1c of 5.0, and one of whom has a hemoglobin A1c of 6.0, neither of them are diabetic, is there any difference in their outcomes? So to put that in perspective, the guy at 5.0 has an average blood glucose of about 100 milligrams per deciliter. 
The person at 6.0 has an average blood glucose of about 120 milligrams per deciliter. So they're both outside that diabetes range. Well, the answer here is actually pretty clear. It is that there is a difference. In fact, for a non-diabetic population, the lower the average blood glucose, as estimated by hemoglobin A1c, the lower the all-cause mortality. Okay, so what's the implication now? Well, if the implication is if you take a group of people who don't have diabetes but want to live longer, i.e., they want to lower their risk of cancer, they want to lower their risk of cardiovascular disease, they want to lower their risk of neurodegenerative disease, I think we can make a pretty reasonable leap of faith that having a lower average blood glucose is better than having a higher average blood glucose, even if that higher average does not put you in the range of a diabetic. So now the question becomes, are there tools to help us manage that? Because the one tool would just be the A1C. You could say, well, I'm just going to get my hemoglobin A1C measured every six months. The problem with that, as we know, is that hemoglobin A1C is very easy to mislead. It's very dependent on red blood cell turnover. So mm -hmm. the more rapidly red blood cells turn over, the more artificially low the hemoglobin A1C will be. And conversely, the longer the red blood cell sticks around, the higher artificially the hemoglobin A1C will be. And it's for that reason that we like to use CGM to actually get true measurements of average blood glucose. When a patient who doesn't have diabetes puts on a CGM for the first time, they're invariably surprised. There's this real learning phase that comes. You've done this, Tim. You were doing this probably 10 years ago. You wore your first one. Everybody goes through this. I remember, you know, for me, it's been about eight years since I started. At first, you simply cannot believe the things that drive your blood glucose up. <laughs> Could you give some examples? Yeah. I mean, like I, I remember the first time I had raisinets, I was like, it's not like I didn't expect it to go up. I didn't expect it to go up like that. Right. Mm -hmm. Exercise, certain forms of exercise. And by the way, I'm not saying this is pathologic. There's nothing wrong when you're exercising for your glucose to skyrocket. If you're doing Tabatas or you're doing HIIT workouts, it's again, it's not pathological, but it's super interesting. And other things that I think are pathological is how much your blood glucose goes up if you had a poor night of sleep. Mm, you know, yeah. if you have a horrible night of sleep, your insulin sensitivity gets crushed the next day and your glucose levels go up. Well, that's actually very interesting. And that, you know, again, maybe you could argue that adds too much stress to the fire, but it's an, it's an insight nevertheless that can help drive a behavior change. I think in the book, I cover kind of my 10 best insights from years of CGM in myself and patients. It's about different foods and like foods high in fiber are going to have one effect, lean sources of protein versus fatty sources of protein, all those sorts of things. Ultimately, I think CGM becomes a really helpful tool for compliance. It becomes a behavioral tool. We tend to gamify it a little bit. I know that when I'm wearing CGM, which I just happen to be right now, by the way, I'm going to think twice before eating something stupid. And again, it's purely just because my personality likes to gamify things, right? It's like, yeah, I'm tempted to go and eat all the leftover waffles on my kid's plate, but I just know it's like, eh, it's going to shoot my blood glucose up and I like not doing that. Where I think people get into trouble and where the counter argument is, which is a fair argument is, look. If you only index on blood glucose, you could still end up doing a bunch of things that aren't healthy. You know, if you ate bacon for every meal every day, your blood glucose would not go that high, but it's probably not the healthiest choice. And I would agree with that. But by that logic, we shouldn't look at body weight either because by smoking cigarettes, your body weight will go down. So does that mean body weight is a lousy measurement? No, it just means that any measurement in isolation can be ridiculous and can be game. So we shouldn't ignore blood glucose any more than we should ignore body weight or body fat or body composition. We just have to understand that it's one of many tools that we can look at. And the CGM, again, do I think this is like necessary to live a longer, healthier life? Of course not. It's simply one tool that we have to help us understand how to regulate one of the, you know, four macronutrients.